The French aircraft industry had only really been gearing up for war when France was overrun and surrendered in 1940. There followed five long years in which no development or production was possible. Aircraft performance in 1945 was almost unrecognisable from that of 1940. Multiple jet aircraft were now in production and two had actually fought in the war. To give you a specific example, the most advanced French fighter in 1940 was the D520. It was a 350 mile per hour fighter with a ceiling of 33,000 feet that weighed just under 6,000 pounds. The most advanced Allied fighter in 1945 was probably the P-80A Shooting Star. It weighed over 13,000 pounds, could fly at nearly 560 miles per hour and could climb to 45,000 feet. And basic performance comparison does not recognise the huge strides in understanding about how to make a modern combat aircraft, which can only really be gained through real experience. In short, the principles for designing a fighter had changed markedly in five years, as had the industrial base required to produce one. The designer, Marcel Bloch, had been incarcerated in Buchenwald from 1944. After his liberation, he elected to return to France under his nom de guerre, Dassou. He was not as immediately welcome as you might expect. In the attempted rearmament in the run-up to 1939, French aviation design and production had been nationalised. This remained the situation in 1946 when plans were formed to reconstitute both the Army de l'Air and French aviation more generally. Although Dassou was able to restart his aircraft company, he was not invited when the Air Force General Staff issued their 1946 plan. Central to this was a desire to purchase a fleet of French-built fighters capable of Mach 0.9 and armed with four 30mm cannons. Considering that it was 1946, this was a fairly ambitious specification. It wouldn't be until the Hawker Hunter that an aircraft of that performance was produced, and the Hunter was quickly superseded by a succession of supersonic fighters. Needless to say that the French state-owned industries responded with enthusiasm. Like the US and the USSR, they were the beneficiaries of a plethora of captured material from Germany. They also had no debts to pay off, giving them an advantage over the British, whose industry was already beginning to enter its long decline. In response to the specification, several aircraft were produced. Arsenal produced the VG-90, which, believe it or not, was the least radical proposal. SNCAC produced the NC-1080. SN Casso produced the SO-620 Espadon. And SN Case made the absolutely wild SE-2410 Gronyard, which, designed to slightly different specifications, successfully met none of them. Each of these aircraft look amazing. On paper, they were world beaters. In reality, all of them were varying degrees of completely useless. They were far too heavy, too aerodynamically suspect, and technically complicated to manufacture. As all of this was unfolding, Marcel Dassou continued to work away at the general staff. Although he was regarded with suspicion by the senior officers, because of his inauspicious pre-war career, or perhaps for a darker reason, his viewpoint garnered a lot of favour in the junior ranks. Dassou was not a genius aircraft designer. He was no Sidney Cam or RJ Mitchell. He was a solid engineer, but more importantly he was able to rein in his own excesses and those of his teams. He applied the cutting edge in a sparing, practical way. New ideas were regularly proposed, but rarely allowed to outlive their usefulness, either on or off the drawing board. This approach found favour with junior officers, who could see the looming disaster in the 1946 plan. Eventually, he persuaded Colonel Georges Grimal, who headed the Material Programs Office, to allow him to develop a lighter alternative that could be lifted by the Rolls-Royce Neen specified by the Air Ministry.
he convinced the colonel by sketching out how he would start from the principles used to design the piston engine block MB-150 to create a relatively simple jet fighter with the intake in the nose. Grimal agreed that Dassault could submit a prototype featuring a minimal set of military equipment and sensible performance parameters, but that he would have to fund the prototype himself. From October 1947, armed with only a few drawing boards and a slide rule, Dassault and three of his close confidants began to work. Reusing the principles of block aircraft from the 1936 to 1940 period and taking advantage of the experience acquired on the MB-150, his small team designed as simple an airframe as possible. By keeping it light, small and inexpensive, they could make the most of the excellent power unit. This skeleton crew of a design team were based between the Great Hall of Saint Cloud and the Seine. There stood a vacant lot housing a rather dilapidated pavilion with exposed woodwork. It was, however, a storied location. Louis Blériot had once lived there. Dassault's design office installed its few drawing boards in the only room on the first floor which still had all of its windows. The advantages of these rudimentary digs were that the designers could follow their work straight to the shop floor on which the prototype Uragan was taking shape. This allowed faster work and rework as the aircraft came together. The fruits of their labours were recognised on December 30th, 1947, when Dassault were awarded a co-contract for three prototypes of an interceptor with a high rate of climb and powerful armament, powered by the Neen engine, which was licensed produced by Hispano Suiza. Dassault had an interesting way of speeding the prototypes into the air. He had two aircraft built simultaneously by two different teams. Whoever won the race could call their aircraft number one. A small prize. Only 18 months after Dassault and his team set out to design their fighter, the MD-450 Uragan took to the air. It was a single-engined, single-seat day fighter. The wing was low-mounted like a sabre and featured a 20-degree leading-edge sweep. The fuselage was circular in cross-section with the intake in the nose. Tail surfaces featured a more radical sweep than the wings, with the horizontal surfaces mounted halfway up the vertical tail. The cabin was pressurised and the canopy was a raised bubble, similar, again, to that enjoyed by the pilot of a sabre. Armament consisted of four hispano Suiza 20mm cannons with 125 rounds per gun. The wing had attachment points for bombs and rockets on the lower surface and for droppable tanks at the end. The first prototype performed well, hitting 600 miles an hour and demonstrating an ability to climb at nearly 8,500 feet per minute. Those are strong numbers for 1949. It wasn't until the F model Sabre that it would climb faster, although it was a good 60 miles per hour faster than this prototype. Unfortunately, when systems were fitted, the added weight reduced performance. The Uragan was realistically limited to about 584 miles an hour. But Dassu had demonstrated the potential of the design. On August 31, 1949, he received an order for 15 pre-production aircraft, later reduced to 12. Following the North Korean invasion of the South in June 1950, the French government ordered 150 Uragans in response to the building tension in Europe. This was increased to 450 shortly thereafter, although ultimately only 213 would be delivered. 185 of these were funded by the US military assistance program. The first production Uragan came off the line on December 20th, 1951 and was delivered on January 30th, 1952. Manufacture of the Uragan was shared between Dassault and the National Aeronautical Construction Companies. But Dassault did the final assembly and they installed all the systems. The first 50 aircraft were MD-450As equipped with the Hispano-Suiza Nien 102 and a Martin Baker ejection seat. 
The remaining aircraft were MD-450Bs with the more powerful Neen 104B and an SN Casso ejection seat. As I mentioned, the Army Dallaire purchased 213 Uragans, switching the remaining order over to the new Mystere in 1953. The type's only other customers for new aircraft were India, who were trying to diversify their supply of weapons, and Israel, who had wanted to buy Canadair Sabres, but were prevented from doing so by embargoes. As with any plane operated by the IDF, that meant that the Uragan would be blooded in combat. Given that it was designed in a shed, largely by instinct and without access to wind tunnels, it shouldn't come as a surprise that the Uragan was a mixed bag dynamically. A small aircraft, the cockpit was easy to climb up to via an external ladder fitted to the right of the nose. Getting in was more of a challenge as space for the pilot was small compared to something like a Sabre or Meteor. Lacking avionic sophistication, the Uragan was, however, easy to start up. The Neen engine, probably the aircraft's strongest point, had some automation for the throttle and mix and thus was easy to start. Although it looks small, the Uragan tips the scales at £13,600 in interceptor configuration. With only a £5,000 force Neen to push it along and a slim wing, the takeoff roll to wheels up is 2,600 feet. That's quite long. A Meteor F8 got airborne in 1,400 feet. One thing that the pilot did have to be aware of on takeoff was the narrow landing gear. The main gear was only 2.4 metres apart. If there were crosswinds, then the Uragan would struggle with directional stability. This was bad enough that takeoffs were not allowed with more than 35 kilometers an hour of wind across the field. Better hope there wasn't bad weather when the war started. Once it got airborne, the initial climb rate in the production models was still strong at 7,500 feet per minute, and it will be at 40,000 feet 10 minutes after takeoff. Although it could reach them, flying the Uragan at these altitudes was not really a pleasant experience. The air conditioning system was not the best, and pilots were either frozen or boiled, depending on how it was feeling that day. In general, the Uragan's comparative lack of power and small control surfaces made it sluggish at high altitudes. There were also some basic issues with its manufacture. Air brakes had a tendency to pop open without warning or instruction above 25,000 feet, which significantly increased fuel consumption if the pilot failed to notice. One good aspect of those brakes, however, was that when they were activated, they did not produce the pronounced upwards deflection of the nose that equivalent US fighters and the MiG-15 suffered from. That would be useful in an air-to-air fight if the defender was attempting to force an overshoot. But back on issues, canopy glass also cracked on many Uragans above 20,000 feet, leading to the cabin losing pressure. Most French squadrons therefore limited the altitude at which those Uragans operated. For these reasons, the Israelis, who used the Uragan for the longest and in the hardest way, chose to use it as a low-level attack aircraft rather than for air defence. Even down low, though, the Uragan was an average performer. Because it lacked any power assistance for the control surfaces, the controls became very heavy at higher speeds. This manifested in slow roll rate and challenges in controlling the aircraft in a dive. There were also manufacturing quality issues with the wings. These seem to have been made slightly asymmetric in many aircraft, meaning that the Uragan would sometimes abruptly depart controlled flight in a tight turn when one wing's control surface is stalled. Fortunately, the resulting spins were relatively easy to recover from. To make matters worse, the elevator was fitted with a system that made the stick progressively heavier as speed increased. This feature was intended to prevent pilots from overstressing the airframe. It's not a feature I've seen in other fighters, at least not in the pre-electronics era. In theory it's a good idea, but in practice pilots need to use maximum performance in life or death situations, 
Better to bend something on the airframe than get shot down or run into the ground. All of this made the Uragan a tricky fighter to employ in a dogfight. The pilot was battling a trio of the enemy pilot, his aircraft's narrow performance window, and the cockpit systems, which lacked any form of automation. If the Uragan's gun sight had been fitted to a MiG, we would have called it laughably antiquated for 1953. That said, at slower speeds and in more level flight, the Uragan was a stable gun platform, and pilots were able to achieve good results both on the ranges and in combat. The four 20mm cannons were mounted in the lower front fuselage, a good natural position for aiming. If fuel tanks were carried, then the pilot may carry either eight Brandt T10 105mm rockets or two 1,000 pound bombs. For very short range missions, up to 16 rockets could be carried. Typical missions lasted around an hour, and range was about 200 miles from base if external stores were being carried. Landing was relatively trouble free, requiring a 3,000 foot prepared strip. Once down, maintenance was easy. The fuselage fuel tanks were fueled from a single point behind the cockpit. Tip tanks needed to be fueled directly into the tank itself. One small point to note on these photos from Mechnes Air Base is the integrated fueling point built into the aircraft parking. This base had obviously been recently refurbished. Ammunition for the cannons was also behind the pilot. The cans weren't removable, which made the turnaround rather longer than it would have been on something like a MiG-15 or something with easier access like the Sabre. This photo also shows how difficult the engine access was. Many fighters at this period featured removable rear sections. Fortunately, the Neen was in general very reliable. As I said, it was the Uragan's best feature. Around 350 Uragans were built, and over half of those were for the Armée de l'Air. Rather than give a blow-by-blow -blow account of its squadron service, I'll just pick out some highlights that give a flavour of its service for its home nation. The Uragan began to arrive in French squadrons in May 1953, starting with the 1st Division of the 12th Squadron. Their first duty was to perform an eight-aircraft fly-pass down the Champs-Élysées in July. Otherwise, they basically just blew up practice targets with cannon fire and rockets and generally practiced for two and a half years before upgrading to the Mystère. Others had more eventful experiences. The Uragan wasn't especially popular in French service because of the numerous minor gripes. For example, the second squadron suffered numerous crashes and struggled to maintain an availability rate above 50%. Of the 87 Uragans used by the second squadron, 15 were lost in accidents and 8 pilots were killed. This didn't stop the 1st Division of 2nd Squadron, who operated 25 aircraft, from clocking up 15,200 hours on the type in 3 years. As a general rule, Uragans replaced Vampire FB-5s and were replaced by either Mysteres or F-84 Thunderstreaks. The exception was the French National Display Team, who converted from the F-84 to the Uragan in order to promote French products abroad. These aircraft are obviously good points of comparison. Unsurprisingly, the Vampire is slower and even less sophisticated than the Uragan. Otherwise, it offers roughly equivalent weapons load and can fly further. Lack of speed made the Vampire obsolete on the European battlefield by 1953, so replacing it was a necessity. In more permissive environments, however, it was still a serviceable close air support platform. When the Uragan met the Vampire in combat during the Suez Crisis, it clearly came out on top. One Vampire was shot down over Israel in the run-up to the conflict in April 1956. Another four were down during the fight itself, all at low level. No Uragans were shot down in return. The F-84 is often seen as an inspiration for the Uragan. In reality, that similarity is due to the identical philosophies employed in their designs, 
the straight wing F-84s are essentially jet powered P-47 Thunderbolts. The Uragan is, as I said, a development of the MB-150, at least in terms of design philosophy. Because it was designed somewhat later than the Thunderjet, the Uragan benefits from research on swept wings and more detailed analysis of the ME-262. Even so, the larger, more powerful Thunderjet has superior performance in every aspect, bar its horizontal turning potential. But as the failure of the state-owned French enterprises shows, the French aviation industry was incapable of making something of that size at this early point in its recovery. Inevitably, the swept wing Mystère and Thunderstreak have even higher performance levels. The Mystère was faster, climb better, and so on. The F 84G, used as a strike aircraft in French service, could carry twice the bomb load, nearly twice as far, and at higher speed. Despite some of its innovative features, the Uragan was thus more or less obsolete by the time it entered squadron service. The Mystère matched up well with the Sabre and MiG-15, but those aircraft were in mass production by 1950. Uragans weren't deployed to Korea, but they did meet MiG-15s during the Suez Crisis. There were a few encounters of note, resulting in a draw, due to the superior quality of Israeli pilots and the fact that Mystères were often around to provide assistance. At 10.30 on the 31st of October 1956, for example, two Uragans searching for targets on a close air support mission were bounced by MiG-15s. Both Uragans jettisoned their tanks and started to manoeuvre, but the MiGs still got into firing positions, shooting from 150 yards or less. Both Uragans were hit, but they escaped the initial engagement. One, piloted by a Captain Rosen, had two 23mm shell holes in the wings, but made it back to base. The other, flown by the flight leader, Ran Sharon, was hit by a 37mm shell and forced to make a belly landing in the desert. This aircraft was ultimately recovered and repaired. Later the same day, an Uragan returned the favour, hitting a MiG-15 with cannon fire. Unfortunately for the Israeli pilot, three of his four cannons jammed and the MiG escaped. After the UK and France intervened, MiG sightings were relatively scarce and there were no other encounters that resulted in confirmed aircraft losses. Two Uragans were lost to ground fire during the conflict. By 1957, all Uragans had been withdrawn from frontline French service. Some aircraft were later used in pilot training for single-seat fast jet conversion until Mystères became available later in the decade. Israel, however, continued to use them for another 10 years or more. Indeed, two squadrons of Uragans played a role in Operation Focus in 1967. During an attack on Bertha Marder on the opening day, Uragans claimed two MiG-17s shot down as they attacked during the unfortunate Fresco's takeoff roll. Uragan pilots were arguably lucky in the attack on Meliz, which started five minutes after that on Bertha Marder. MiG-17s there actually got airborne, but rather than engage their inferior opponents, the MiGs fled the scene. After the war, the final Uragans went into reserve, 18 were sold to El Salvador and saw service into the 80s. The type was also used by India in border skirmishes between India and Pakistan, again in a close air support role. One aircraft was lost, briefly displayed in Pakistan, and later scrapped. When judging the Uragan, I think we have to be conscious of the context of its production. France felt the strategic need to restart its military aviation industry. Producing any kind of jet fighter was therefore important to them as it could act as a fillip to various tiers of designer and manufacturer and thus be a base for industrial growth. In many ways, it was equivalent in ambition to the earlier MiG-9, without which the MiG-OKB would not have emerged and likewise the Soviet jet industry would have lagged much further behind NATO. In the strategic sense, the Uragan was therefore a major success. It gave Marcel Dassault the credibility and the capital to produce a succession of impressive, if never really world-beating, aircraft from a capability and a commercial standpoint. 
Without it, there likely would be no French military aviation industry today. And we should also remember that much of the programme was ultimately funded by the US, another strategic victory for France. All of that is fortunate, because when judged purely on its own merits, it's hard to be positive about the Uragan. Although one Israeli general famously remarked that it proved to be better than they expected, he didn't say at what level their expectations started. It is easy to exceed a low base. A Sabre could do everything the Uragan could do, but substantially better, including being more biddable and easy to fly. Essentially, the Uragan had all of the vices of a MiG-15 with none of the performance upsides. The Gloucester Meteor F-8 outperformed it in every respect, and we see that aircraft as being obsolete by the time of Korea. We can be kind to the MiG-9 because it emerged in 1949. The Uragan wasn't in service until 1953, which puts its capabilities into stark relief. So that's the story of the Uragan in a nutshell. A strategic success but a tactical failure. More the weather forecast warning of a hurricane than the storm itself. <laughs>